Father, to the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Glory to Jesus Christ. Glory to God. So we've reached the midpoint of the great fast. And the church, as we know, in the middle of it always puts up the cross. One to remind us of our path, to show us where we're going, and to strengthen us, encourage us in our struggle. We might complete the 40 days and, of course, go into Holy Week with fervor. It is, of course, the same sign by which St. Constantine was told by this sign, conquer. And it is by this sign that we also conquer. It's a difficult message, as we know. In the first part of this Gospel, he would come after me and deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. That's a hard message. We tend to pass over it and gloss over it and not really hear what it's saying. But that message does not allow us to be complacent. It doesn't allow us to stay put in the lives we've been living or have lived. It allows us to or encourages us to change everything. Denying ourselves is something we don't like to do. We typically like to indulge ourselves, and especially in contemporary society where everything seems to be an indulgence. More food, more sugar, more faster this, faster that, more entertainment, more indulgence of anything we can possibly imagine. That is really not the right path. I was commenting to someone yesterday, I really fear for our society that we live in. I'm not the first person that said this. Because when actual persecution ever does come, how will we deal with it? We're so used to having everything we want in the minute. Our lazy boy is not exactly conducive to persecution in a prison cell. So we have to start reminding ourselves that maybe there's some little things in life we need to cut back on and be more simple with. It is the way to get rid of our anxieties. And it is the path of salvation. The path of salvation is through the cross. The path of salvation is through the wilderness for 40 years before we get into the promised land. There's always struggle. As St. Seraphim famously said, no suffering, no salvation. But it's true. And the cross has been prefigured in the Old Testament many times. Of course, we have the image of Moses striking the waters with his staff and bringing his people Israel through it and then conquering their persecutors by crossing it back with the staff again, this wooden staff. We have the image of the waters of Mara that were bitter. When the tree was put into it, they became sweet. A tree accomplished this. We have the image of Jacob crossing his hands over Ephraim and Manasseh to the chagrin at first of his son, but he intended to do that, blessing the one before the other, and that image of the cross with his hands became a significant thing. We could go on and on and on with the images of the tree and what it has meant throughout the Old Testament, but more so what it means in the New and how we should live by that. It is by this sign that we conquer. We are sealed with the sign of the cross at our baptisms and chrismations. We continue to seal people with it at the anointings and the different services, the unction services, and virtually everything we do. We cross ourselves multitudes of times every day if we're following just a basic rule of prayer. In an Athenite rule of prayer, they have what they call stavrota, which is crosses. And they cross themselves literally thousands of times. Some people find that beneficial, some people find it not so beneficial because it becomes distracting for them. But I mean, when you see them just flailing, 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 doing the cross, Elder Paisios said that he would do this cross so many times with his right hand, and someone said, Yeah, but then my hand gets tired doing that, my arm wears out. He said, Well, when my arm wears out, I start crossing myself with the left. That was Elder Paisios. Nothing would stop him for his fervor, for struggle, for Christ, and to do what he needed to do to find Christ. His life was informed completely by Christ. So a book was put out a few years ago. I won't necessarily recommend it to you, but it's about I, about um, St. Sophroni. It's a book that uh, was an academic dissertation from his nephew, Nicholas Sokarov, who is a monastic himself. It's a wonderful book. It's rather heady at points. But at one point, he contrasts the liturgical theology of uh, Father Alexander Schmemann with that of Father Sophroni. And they are quite in distinction from one another. 
Now, Father uh, Schmemann was not wrong about everything he said in there. He certainly was not wrong about increasing people's food for the liturgy and the kingdom of heaven and believing in those things. But Father Sofroni felt that he had missed a point. The, so much of emphasis was being in the kingdom of heaven that he missed the self-denial part of it, the self-emptying and the crucifixion. Because for Father Sofroni, everything was about self-denial and embracing the cross that we might rise up with Christ. And the liturgy is self-emptying. If you listen to it over and over and over, it clearly makes the point that it is not just about what happens in the future. It is about our struggle now. In fact, it begins at the proscomedia with the words of Isaiah, the suffering servant. The tone is set immediately of the cross. By that precious blood redeemed from the curse of the law is the first words. And it goes on and on and on. That suffering servant whose judgment is taken away and his humiliation. And he goes through that throughout the service. Yes, there are glorious parts. But it comes to a point at the epiclesis where the priest consecrates the gifts and really contrasts to the West where that was taken out of the service. The epiclesis was taken out because they said the words of Christ are sufficient. And people like Father Sofroni emphasized that this is wrong, that epiclesis is absolutely necessary because even Christ himself would not deify himself even though he was God. He would not put himself in a position to be able to do anything without the Father and the Holy Spirit just by his saying of words. The Holy Spirit was called upon into that process. So it reminds the priest as well that it is not he that is doing these things. His hands act as the vessels and the instruments, but yes, it is the Holy Spirit that acts through the priests in calling upon, of course, the Savior to make these things happen. So we must remember the self-emptying that is part of the Christian life. You might remember the words that I love to quote of Elder Moses of Octina, that whatever comes to pass this day is what I desire. And that is, in fact, of course, not exactly his quote. It comes from Dorotheus of Gaza much earlier. And we remember the prayer of the Octina elders, that we might accept all that this day brings with spiritual tranquility, whatever it might be. That prayer goes on and on. Many of you know it. But the life, the life we live brings difficulties and trials each and every day and things we don't want. It brings suffering, it brings sickness, it brings illness, it brings persecution, it brings insults, it brings hunger, it brings thirst. But these saints say glory to God for all things because they know God is working out their salvation. To deny oneself and take up a cross is not an easy thing. It is not something that we necessarily desire to do, but it is the path of salvation. It is the path that we see Jesus Christ himself walk. And we also have to walk that path. But Father, this is not what we hear the televangelist saying. No, it's not. It's very much in the face of that. I can't promise you the Rolls Royce and the mansion if you follow Jesus Christ. I can promise you a cross. And if you take up that cross, I can promise you the kingdom of heaven. If you accept that cross, the good news comes with a struggle. As we see that he promised his disciples and he himself went through. So far as to go down to Hades for us, out of love for us, we too in our own hearts in a great sense, must follow Christ into Hades, that we might rise up with him. And we will do that in this life. And if we accept that word, a hard word, we'll eventually find ourselves hearing, well done, faithful servant, enter into the joy of the Lord, because you followed the path that Christ set out for us. In the last days of St. Varsanofi of Octina, he was suffering very badly, and the people were trying to take care of him and, and ease his pain and say, poor, ye, poor elder, poor elder, and things like this. And he finally, rather strongly, says to them, leave off, leave me, because you are trying to take me down from my cross. I am being crucified. And he wanted to be. 
because he knew that in this martyrdom that he was going through, Christ was working out his salvation, whatever needed to be there for his humility, for his patience, for his strength, for his faith. Denying ourselves is not something we like to do. But the scriptures are very, very, very clear and very blunt about it. There's no gray area in it. Christ promises us over and over and over a cross and tells us to take up a cross, an instrument, a torch that we wear around as jewelry, hopefully more than that, meaning something because the cross is full of life. Christ has been on the cross and Christ has filled it up with life. So we must take up our cross and follow him. St. Paul says, I am crucified to the world and the world is crucified to me. If you want to explore that concept a little bit more, I encourage you to read the Ropius of Goslip. He goes quite a ways talking about this concept. Being crucified to the, or crucifying the world to us is not caring about all the things of the world so much. Not about the good things, of course, that God has made good, but those things that lead to the passions, those things that are distracting, those things that are tearing us apart. And for us to be crucified to the world is to crucify the passions within ourselves. That's a very small version of what he says. But I've been coming across more and more lately, as I was mentioning to the deacon this morning, fear. Fear and anxiety of the world around us. That's not Christian. We should not fear the world around us. We should not fear anything but he who has power to cast into hell. And that is not the devil. It is God. And we fear God not with the fear of someone who's persecuting us, but the fear of offending someone we love, of the one we love and being separated from that person. We immerse ourselves, as I've said probably too many times, in entertainment, in social media, and news, and news, and news, to where it's coming out of our ears every day. How much of it can we tolerate? How much of it can we bear as it brings our souls down deeper and deeper and deeper into despair? And it also makes us judge everyone around us, which absolutely takes grace away from us. Why do we do this to ourselves? 30 years ago, we couldn't. But why do we do that to ourselves? Now, we need to know. Oh, Father, we need to know this is happening. No, we don't. What we're missing in the middle of all that is what's going on in here and distracting ourselves with these big problems in the world. Meanwhile, there's a fire going on in my soul and tearing it apart, and I'm not healing that. So, so what is going on in Pennsylvania Avenue or what's going on in Moscow or Syria or wherever else? So what's going on downtown Atlanta or with COVID or anything else while well, the passions are raging in my soul? As I get to the judgment, I'm not going to be asked, okay, so what did you think would happen with the present race? What do you think happened with the handling of COVID? That's not going to be asked of you. Did you keep my commandments is what is going to be asked. Did you follow me? I showed you the path. Christ showed you the path and walked it himself and says, he who denies me will take up his cross and follow me. Following Christ is not easy, as the apostles found out. But following Christ, as we heard at the end of this gospel today, will allow some to see the kingdom of heaven come in glory before Christ's second coming, as many of the saints have and did and will. So if we desire to see Christ in this lifetime, we might see him in the next. The message is clear. Whatever Christ sends us, glory be to God. Whether it be struggles, whether it be suffering, whether it be joy, whether it be glory, whatever it may be, Thanks be to God, and not thanks be to me or to you, thanks be to God for all things. St. John Chrysostom's words that we love to recite at the end of his life, read his letters to Olympia, by the way, if you want to get that in context, when he's sick all the time and suffering terribly. The physical pain is immense, and his word is a difficult word, glory to God for all things. Because those are the words that Christ gives us, really the words that Christ gives us, to give glory to God for whatever he sends us, good or bad. And this is not a message of despair. This is a message of hope, because it's a message which is used as the instrument to raise us up into the kingdom of heaven. By ascending the cross, we can descend with Christ in the humility, 
be raised to the right hand of the Father in glory. Amen. Amen.